Hey guys, telehealth is use of digital information and communication technologies such as computers and mobile devices to access healthcare services remotely and manage your healthcare. These may be uh, technologies that you use from home or that your doctor uses to improve or support healthcare services. And as many of you know, telehealth and telemedicine has gotten really popular, especially during the time of COVID. And uh, many of you out there may have already used telehealth or telemedicine uh, as a form of your healthcare practices. Uh, but tonight, guys, listen, for more information about this, stick around, stay tuned, because we're going to answer some questions. We're going to talk about kidney disease, nephrology, and the use of telehealth and how it's utilized in kidney healthcare. Stick around, guys. <laughs> Jonathan is created as an informational, educational, and entertainment show. Hope with Jonathan hosts, guests, partners, provide information on the basis of research and personal experiences, and is not to be taken as or implied as diagnosis of any disease or treatment. Hope with Jonathan, its host and guests and partners, recommend and encourage you to speak to your medical team before implementing any treatment or diagnosis found on this show or any product, service associated to Hope with Jonathan. Hey guys, welcome back to Hope with Jonathan podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Trailer, a grateful kidney transplant recipient who utilizes his story uh, to share stories of hope right here on Hope with Jonathan. Tonight, we have a very, very special guest all the way from Georgia, guys, all the way from Georgia. I cannot wait to bring her on the show tonight. So informative, uh, nephrologist uh, Sharika Brookings on the show tonight, guys. It's going to be an exciting interview. We're going to talk about uh, kidney health. Uh, we're going to talk about telehealth and telemedicine and how it's utilized in kidney health care. 
And uh, it's going to be an incredible show. I really appreciate everyone's support for the uh, Hope with Jonathan podcast. I hope you guys are having a blessed evening. And I appreciate everyone. I, I would really appreciate it, guys, if you could uh, share this show uh, with all your friends. And also, guys, if you wouldn't mind at all to hit that subscribe button, it would definitely help us out right here on Hope with Jonathan. Uh, show your support by way of just uh, hitting that subscribe button. It's completely free to do so. But guys, listen, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring on our special guest. Really excited tonight uh, to bring her on the show. Hope you guys will get involved with this one and ask questions, engage, and like I said, share this with all your friends out there, all your all your kidney buddies out there, and all your friends and family. Uh, but guys, without further ado, I want to welcome to the show uh, Dr. Uh, Sharika Brookins. Welcome to the show, Sharika Welcome, Sharika, to the show. <laughs> hey, Jonathan. <laughs> hey, your music you? is awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time on on those videos and stuff. So <laughs> I feel like I was truly coming to the stage. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. It's it's definitely a pleasure to have you on. I think uh, we connected with uh, uh, a second chance with uh, Philip and uh, Tafaro. Uh, over there uh, on a conference that we did. So uh -huh. it is truly a, a pleasure to uh, finally have you on the show because um, I'm definitely interested since I uh, use telehealth and, and all that stuff for my care and things like that. So Shrika, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about yourself, where you're from. All right. Um, well, I am Sharika Brookins. I'm a kidney health physician. That's what I like to say. Kidney Although, health. you know, my job is to take care of, you know, your kidneys in a disease state. Mm -hmm. I think it's far more important to promote prevention and um, to talk about kidneys while they're also in a healthy state. So I like to consider myself a kidney health physician. Mm -hmm. um, I am a board certified nephrologist in Georgia. So mm -hmm. although I am located in Augusta, Georgia, through telehealth, I can service all of Georgia. So I don't have to limit myself just to um, taking care of individuals in Augusta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, medical school at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm also a board certified internal medicine doctor. So that means I do general medicine. I'm certified in general medicine as well as kidneys, but I focus on kidney care. And I did that at the University of Florida in Jacksonville, oh. which is my hometown. Okay. And then I went back to Nashville at Vanderbilt to do my kidney training. And so from there, um, I relocated here to Georgia, in which I joined a private practice. And that started it all. And that started it all. <laughs> that so, started it all. <laughs> and so now you're in the ATL area. I am actually two hours East of Atlanta. Oh, east of Atlanta. Okay. Uh -huh. I am okay. I'm right here on the border of South Carolina. So I'm right at the Savannah River. Okay. So yeah. that's like close to like the Myrtle Beach area, huh? Yep. Not too not too far. Not too not far. too far. No. Not too far. So what made you want to uh get involved with uh kidney care or nephrology or nef become a nephrologist? What was there something that impacted you early on in your life or family member maybe that suffered with kidney disease or what's your story on that? Well, thank you for asking that. I love to to share this because I had no family members nor friends with kidney disease. So when I tell you this purpose that I'm living is really not about me. So I did my undergrad at Florida State University and I was in my senior year and I loved volunteering since high school. Mm -hmm. So every year or every semester, I would try and do something different 
to kind of expose myself to something that I didn't know anything about. So I was in my senior year and I said, okay, well, I need to find something different to do. And there was um, an organ donation group that came to the college campus because the role that they wanted to do was to recruit more college students to encourage others to become organ donors. Okay. So, so it's kind of like, um, I think soda. Okay. Soda. Okay. Right. It's just Uh like soda, but donate life had, um, they had like their own in-house works in which they tried to reach out to college campuses to, to find students to recruit, to educate. So I joined uh, that project. Mm -hmm. And so the goal was at Florida State, myself and some other students, we were going to work the tent to kind of get people to to sign up as organ donors and to learn more about it and to dispel the myths. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed it so much that once I graduated and I went back home to Jacksonville, I wanted to continue volunteering. Okay. The good thing about Jacksonville is we have a Mayo of Jacksonville and that's where a fair amount of kidney transplants are performed in that region of Florida, in the Northeast region of Florida, outside of Gainesville, Florida, mm-hmm. Mayo Jacksonville is where a fair amount of kidney transplants and other organ transplants are performed. So I continued to volunteer back home and I met another young lady while volunteering. We were the same age. So our goal was not only are we going to hit up the college campuses in Jacksonville, but we were two young black females okay. and we wanted to hit up the HBCU campus in Jacksonville, which is a historically black college and university. Okay. So we we had it planned out. We we knew we were going to be that team to rally up college students to learn more about um, organ donation. Mm-hmm. Well, for me, that was my story of how I got involved. But she actually was on the transplant list. So when I learned of her story, we we're pretty much the same age. And her story was she was on a softball scholarship to college, to mm-hmm. another HBCU. Mm-hmm. And when she went to do a screening test, she had a ton of protein in her urine. Uh-huh. And so okay. and and you may have heard these stories before that yep. sometimes when you have protein, when you have large amounts of protein in your urine, you may or may not have symptoms. Right. It may just be something that you find out all of a sudden yep. haphazardlessly. Well, when mm-hmm. she went to get checked, she learned that she was suffering from kidney failure. And mm-hmm. so from there, she had to get put on a transplant list and therefore losing her scholarship and not being able to go to college. Yeah. So so seeing this young lady experience this, it just truly hit home to how you never know what someone is going through. Mm -hmm. And that could have been me. That could have been my cousin. That could have been my friend. That could have been my family members. It could have been anyone. So it piqued my curiosity to say, how was this even possible? How is it that someone can have you know, and what we know of it as it's a silent disease? How is it that someone can have a disease so um, drastically changing her life, but not have any idea about it. So, right. And as you know, you know, in some of older transplant recipients, I hear a lot of stories about they had protein in their urine early on, but the doctor said, Oh, you know, it's just a little trace or it's not very much. So we won't worry about it right now. And then years later, here they are, You know, they're in kidney failure and they need dialysis and they need a transplant and all this stuff. So, you know, protein is definitely something that uh, needs to be looked at for sure. And we know that now. uh, Right. Looking back, you know, uh, you know, 10, 20, you know, 30 years ago when patients were having protein in their urine, it was kind of overlooked, you know, for a lot of people. It was. Yeah. And it's definitely a red flag. And it's one of those Mm -hmm. things where even if you have a small amount. Mm -hmm there should still be intervention. Right. Right. And so what we, what we have now within, when I, when I say we, I'm speaking a lot on the, from the perspective of kidney societies Mm -hmm. is that even if someone's creatinine is normal, Mm -hmm. but you see protein in their urine, they should still be referred to the nephrologist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there are conditions that you can have protein in your urine And your creatinine can be normal, but we can still intervene at some point. And most importantly, we can monitor you more frequently, which Mm -hmm. is going to go into this whole telehealth thing. And that's why I love telehealth, because I can monitor 
my patients or my family, as I like to call them, I can monitor them more frequently. Yeah. I think it's beautiful that, you know, you got involved with a project and, you know, wanted to help uh, talk about organ donation and becoming an organ donor. And then you were impacted by uh, your, your friend's story. And then that caused you to ultimately want to get involved with uh, nephrology. Uh, I'm guessing is that that's pretty much what happened. Yeah. So from there, I started. So I was pre-med in college, but I will tell you when you're pre-med, you don't learn the ins and outs of the disease process. You just kind of learn where the organs are. So once once learning her story, I got more interested in actually learning about diseases of the kidney and by learning about diseases of the kidney, I was able to learn about the demographics. I was able to learn about the disparities. And it just really, because in my community, I didn't have dialysis centers in my community and I didn't have family members on dialysis. So I didn't know about it. But once I started to dig more with my curiosity, it was just, it was breathtaking and alarming on how it, it truly affected certain populations. And so it almost made me think, well, how can I make a difference, right? How can I be of representation and to make a difference? And I'll also say the kidney is such a smart organ and um, it's very yeah. complex. So it was another reason I was like, hey, I like complicated things. That's- yeah. When I crashed into kidney failure, I started using Google. <laughs> Google Google's my, was my friend and I began to research so much about the kidney and I had no idea how impactful the kidney was to the body uh, with, the, you know, your brain activity, mm-hmm. your cognitive uh, responses, you know, your muscles um, and, you know, your bone health and all this stuff. It's just like such a, you know, impactful organ that is that you have to have. I mean, you just got to have your kidneys. Although, you know, if you do fail, you can, you know, live on dialysis. But it's just it's inc- it's an incredible organ. Uh, it very, is very interesting. And 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 something that you mentioned and you've mentioned it on your previous shows is just, mm-hmm. you know, although no one wants to experience dialysis, how grateful you are to have had that opportunity. Mm-hmm. But the kidneys are the only organ. Right. That has a device that can allow someone to live on in an end stage. Yeah, for for a long period or a you know a decent amount of time. I'm not sure about like an LVAD if your heart starts failing. I know some people wear that for a while, but it, I don't think it's as long as a, and maybe you can survive on it as as dialysis. Right. And I will say, um, although an LVAD would be, you know, kind of the equivalent because it's like an end stage heart failure. Mm -hmm. But technically, um, it's it's not considered the same or equivalent to dialysis for that reason that you say how people can go on dialysis, Mm -hmm. you know, and live for decades. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a lady in my center that had been living on it for like 20 some odd years. Yeah. And but she was really strict on the renal diet and she watched her fluids. And but uh, man, I was like, you know, these are these are the true kidney warriors, these long term yeah. kidney patients that live long term on dialysis. And, you know, and there's some patients out there that are never going to get a transplant or maybe they're not eligible for a transplant and they're going to have to survive on dialysis. And uh, some patients are OK with that. Uh, yeah. You know, and some uh, are. Thank God. Thank God that we have dialysis. Uh, You know, I am very grateful for that. There's some aspects of dialysis and the business model of it that I'm a little um, (laughs) I'm a little uh, shaky on. Uh, I'll maybe I'll save that for another show, (laughs) but it does does have an ugly side. (laughs) I can tell you and, and I share your sentiments and, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up because. And this and it does all tie into telehealth because telehealth and kidney care and telehealth and other specialties, you're going to see a different sort of training from a different generation. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we're in kidney training, it's almost like. It's almost like those it's almost like when you're that star athlete. Right. And mm-hmm. you have those that want you to go to college and those that want you to go straight to the pros like those dialysis people are at us. Yeah. Right. Immediately of, hey, do you want to start and do a joint venture? And it's like. I just want to finish my training and, you know, 
to help some people. And but yeah. it's like, yeah. let's take it to the max. What city are you going to? We can bring a new dialysis center to your city, and you can do a joint venture. And it's like, no, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And that and that kind of leads me up to my next question. So. What what you know, most, most doctors, when you see them like graduate college and then they, you know, either open up their own office or they join a another firm or, you know, office and become a partner or whatever. Uh, why? Why telehealth? What was what was the reasoning behind wanting to open uh, just and doing telehealth? Well, um, I'll tell you this, and it's not just in nephrology, mm -hmm. but burnout is a thing. <laughs> okay. And. And it's not just burnout in medicine. There's burnout in education. There's burnout in a variety of sectors. And in medicine, um, the pressures of what the people overhead require of you, right? Because mind you, we train to take care of patients. Right. But once you go, whether it be in academia, there's a lot that they request and require of you. And the same with private practice, um, you can you can get very bogged down. And right. so with nephrology, we're like I like to tell people we're like a three prong specialty. So I not only have to see my patients in clinic every day, but then I also have to jet over to the hospital and see my patients that are in the hospital. And then I also have to see those that are in dialysis. Yeah. OK, so not only did I do that. But I also did that in a nearby rural town. So I had a mm -hmm. clinic there and I managed a dialysis center there. Mm -hmm. So I when I tell you it was you're just spread all over the place. So yeah. how can you truly be an effective doctor when you're spending so much time with trying to keep up with where well, you don't want people to have to wait long? Yeah. So if my previous visit goes over, now I have to shorten this visit. OK, right. but now I have a doctor on the phone because I have a new patient coming to the hospital. But, you know, either I don't have long, I'll be over to see them. And then I may still have to go sign something at the dialysis center or, oh, my patient that didn't come on Monday, they did come on Wednesday. So now I have to go see them on Wednesday in order for me to get reimbursed like I want to get reimbursed. It was just you're all over the place. Yeah. And o overwhelming. Sounds very overwhelming. It's very overwhelming. Yeah. And it's and the patient suffers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I'm sure you had to be quick with some of your patients because of the schedule. And like you had mentioned, you know, you got if it runs over, then and so then you're it's kind of like quality of care kind of goes out the window and you're more focused on time and things like that. And I can and, see how quickly it happened. And here's the thing, Jonathan, when you're fresh out of training, you you don't know how to manage your time. Right. So for me, my patients are my priority. So my patients, their time does not suffer. I eventually suffer. And I bring that home to my family. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then eventually, when you when you start to see how it affects your family, then you say, OK, I have to tighten up my time at work. So whether that means I can't sit with the pharmacist and hear them talk about the drug at lunch you know, I need to go do these notes or I need to go run across the street to the hospital. It, it was a lot. And then the worst is when your patients can't get in contact with you. Yeah. So, so, so how did, uh, so how does telehealth relieve all that for you? So telehealth relieves all of that because for me, when I tell you, it just opens up the gate of that two-way communication mm -hmm. to where, Previously, if a patient wanted to contact me, you would call the clinic and then you would get a message to my nurse who would then tell me and then I have to find time. But when your system is built up to function on telecommunications, mm -hmm. you tend to do such a good job at that versus you know, some offices are going into the hybrid models, right? So they're still kind of struggling because they're doing some in person, some telehealth. But my patients can text me. My patients can email me. And because my time is now, you know, organized and I have slots designated for catching up, I can respond to my patients quickly. I can talk to them on the phone. Mm -hmm. And and then the other the other benefit to telehealth, and I know that you can attest to this as a transplant patient, 
is mm-hmm. the frequent monitoring. And that's what I truly love yeah. the most is because I really, I really disliked if I followed up with someone, say every four months or every six months, yeah. and then we get these surprise labs. I yeah. hate. And you're, you're able to do this from home. You don't have an office right now. You're doing it from home. I do. I do it from home, but I do have um, an office downtown, but okay. I'm still able to do this from home. Yes. Okay. But, um, but the surprise labs, like the moments of where something happened, we don't know when it happened, but now, okay, we have to get you admitted to the hospital mm-hmm. or, okay. So now we have to try and figure this out and see what's going on. But when we're able to monitor more frequently, and not to mention the communication. Now you have no problem with texting me if it's two in the morning. And see the thing about the texting and calling in your training, Mm -hmm. we had to do that. Mm -hmm. If our patients were on EPO, Mm -hmm. they would check their blood pressure late at night. And if their blood pressure was high, they will call us the fellows and we would answer it. But once you get into private practice, you kind of have this change in mindset of, well, I want to protect my my time or something and your patients can't contact you and the system right. just isn't built up for that. Yeah. So being in this private practice setting, I knew immediately that this was not for me. And it's interesting because a colleague of mine that trained after me, she said the same thing. She was like, Sharika, I spend more time in my car than with my dialysis patients. And I hate it. It's like, you know, the dialysis center I managed, I would have 30 chairs and I have to hurry up and see everyone because now I have to go to the clinic. Yeah. And then I have to come back to see the second shift. And it's like you don't have that time to really spend with everyone. Right. And that's important. And, uh, you know, to spend be able to spend quality time with with your patients and uh, for them to get the utmost you know care uh, possible. Hey, I want to send a quick shout out to uh, Steve, the kidney nurse, uh, Steve Belcher. He's got a, a quick question for you. And, and this was actually on my list of questions for you. Okay. As well. uh, because, you know, in telehealth, you're not in person. So uh, what about the physical assessment portion of a telehealth visit? Is it you guys are mainly looking at lab work or do, are you able to do like a physical assessment sort of on the phone or webcam or how did how does that work? So I will tell you when it comes to the physical assessment portion in the field of nephrology, and I tell people it's a lot different from different specialties. What's truly important to us is going to be your blood pressure and your weight. Mm -hmm. And with telehealth, if you can either have someone with a scale or their blood pressure already at home, or we have a program that's called remote patient monitoring, which is where insurance covers for these devices to be mailed to your patient's home and they check their blood pressure, they get on the scale, check it as frequently as you want them to. And it's reported remotely to your office. So you can screen for these quite often. If someone doesn't already just have um, those devices at home, but in a, in a general kidney. And I mean, you tell me in a general clinical office of kidneys, how like how intense is your physical exam? Right. I mean, in regard to like maybe listening to your heart with the stethoscope or your lungs, maybe or something like that. Uh, that's probably about as physical. I mean, of course, they they watch you weigh and all right. that type of stuff. But I mean, you can do blood pressure. You can do oxygen test at home. All of that. Uh, remote. You can weigh. you can weigh yourself. Uh, but you know, like a stethoscope on your, on your heart or any of that, they, you, I mean, you can't really do that part of it, but I guess if you have that much of a, a fear, I guess at that point you would probably want to, uh, really force a physical appointment if you can get one. Well, I will tell you for, for instance, when it comes to heart rhythms, right, those mm-hmm. are going to be like, even in my heart failure patients that I share with, um, that I share with my heart failure clinic, right? Mm -hmm. The main ones that you would be concerned with for their heart rhythm are those that are in AFib. Right. And then I can tell you there are little tricks to to the monitoring device. Of course, you don't want to rely on that, but there are tricks in which you can tell if someone is in AFib or not 
based on how their their numbers are reported out. But the key thing is, if you're asymptomatic, I'm not going to do anything differently. Even if you are in front of me in clinic and you're actively in AFib, but you're asymptomatic, I'm not changing your therapy. The same with um, with your breathing status. I can sit and tell if you're in in um, in the labored breathing status, right? If sure. you're in distress, because sure. hearing your lungs and that's another thing. You know, the stethoscope is good, but there is operator error when it comes to that, right? Because I can have an emergency room doctor tell me my dialysis patient has crackles and I can go listen to them and I don't hear the same thing. But guess what? They look like they're in distress, so they're going to get dialysis. I don't care what their lungs sound like. Right. Right. So when it comes to what is required from an insurance perspective, like reimbursing, what's required um, on a physical exam is you know, that you, that you feel that you can effectively assess a patient. And for me, what's important is your weight, your blood pressure, and then watching you, I can see, you know, someone can show you what their legs look like and just definitely monitoring and seeing how you react to me on the camera. Yeah. You don't want them having cankles walking around like I did. (laughs) I was walking around with cankles and uh, you know, and um, my uh, my fluids were overloaded. I I'll be honest, I, I had no education, uh, uh, Sharika, on uh, on kidney disease before I crashed into emergency dialysis. So uh, I yeah. was walking around like that, and uh, I, I I didn't realize. I mean, it got to a point I literally couldn't put my shoes on. And mm-hmm. uh, looking back on that, that was a light bulb moment. It should have been a oh crap, you know, I need right. to do something about this, but. Uh, you, you were talking about the uh, phone calls, and I'm, I'm interested because, you know, most doctors don't want to give their personal phone number out uh, to their patient, you know, for the sake of privacy and things like that. Uh, but, like, let's say a patient has a problem at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning, and they reach out. Is that, like, a, a an answering service that you guys have, or how, how does that work? So the answering service is a provider. Mm-hmm. So if you're calling and and honestly, in the academic world, it's more so the answering service is you get you get us, you get the fellow. Mm -hmm. But when I got to private practice, actually, the private practice group I was in, it was the same way. When Mm -hmm. you called um, when you called the the emergency line or the after hours line, Mm -hmm. you got us on. Now you have some offices that will maybe direct you to a nurse or they'll direct you to someone to maybe take a message. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's always been the way that I've learned is that you get a doctor on the phone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a part of a a large transplant facility. I'm in the San Antonio, Texas area. So it's a large populated area. Uh, My transplant center does thousands of transplants per year, uh, Methodist specialty and transplant. And uh, they actually, when I call down there, most of the time I'm leaving voice messages uh, because you never hardly get a hold of someone because they're always working the phone or on, you know, talking with another patient. Uh, They're really good about getting a hold of me. I I have a really great um, connection over there with the uh, person that's in charge. And but a lot of times I'm leaving. And even during the time when I had COVID. Uh, Mm -hmm. I had contracted COVID and found out on a Sunday. And when I called over there, I even had as a transplant recipient, I had to leave a message with a a nurse on call. And, uh, you know, they finally called me back and, you know, treated me, told me what the options were over the phone. Uh, But that was the way it was handled. I never went in uh, to see anyone. Uh, I was pretty much told I had to kind of tough it out because they were telling me there was no monoclonal antibody treatments available. They didn't know when they were going to get any in. And in fact, they were telling me it wasn't going to be very effective for the Omicron uh, because, you know, it was a new variant. Uh, Mm -hmm. So they they pretty much told me to make sure I drink a lot of fluids, quarantine, stay in and all that. I'm kind of changing the subject going into the COVID aspect, but um, that's, that's, that's what they told me over the phone. So that was the kind of care uh, that I'm, I'm kind of used to it though, because, you know, my facility is a, a large facility. So when I'm calling them, most of the time I'm, I'm getting a voice, a voice message or I'm, I'm leaving a message with someone. 
Well, I will say it it's an important point that you make because during the pandemic, a lot of systems were stressed. Mm-hmm. So um do do I sound okay? No, you sound fine. You sound excellent. Okay. Because your audio your audio is a little at least maybe it's just on my end. Okay. A little glitchy. It went a little robotic. Okay. Huh. But I don't know if it's because of maybe COVID, a lot of some systems are stressed. But again, you know, I trained at a transplant facility. Mm -hmm. And when you all got the call two o'clock in the morning to come and get your kidney, Mm -hmm. I was on the road to come in along with the surgical team to come in to get you prepared as a dialysis patient, as Mm -hmm. well as the surgeons getting ready. And so we just always practice that way. And so the way I have my practice set up is how I would like for my family or to be treated as a patient. So I don't mind the late phone calls. There are a lot of doctors that don't mind it. Um, And generally those tend to have, in my opinion, better relationships with their patients. Sure. Absolutely. And that's, that's what you want. I mean, you shouldn't be afraid of doctors and you shouldn't be afraid to talk, you know, with your doctors. So you want, you want that, that good basis. It's not like you're going to be best friends and maybe go shopping together or go out to dinner together, (laughs) but you want that. you know, common respect. Yeah. Yeah. And the patient respect. I mean, you're not calling me to order pizza. Like (laughs) this is your health. This is important. So, you know, if you're really struggling and you're not feeling well with your breathing, or if you had a headache and you checked your blood pressure in the middle of the night, then we can talk about what's going on, maybe what to do. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it's incredible. I think it's incredible technology. Uh, what are, what are sort of some of the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, telehealth or telemedicine? I will say um, one of the disadvantages um, is, but we we spoke briefly about it. One of the disadvantages is dialysis. Mm -hmm. And that is because we're still required to do that in-person visit four times a month. And because of telehealth, you can't, you know, you can't do that. So you still have to be seen physically four times a month. However, our industry is shifting to encourage more at-home dialysis. And Mm -hmm. so through this at-home dialysis, um, like with um, home dialysis patients, one of the things is, well, instead of having to see your doctor face-to-face every month, you only have to see them once a quarter. So you can do, so you can do of your, every three months, you can do one visit and you can do one visit in person and the rest can be remote. And other than that, we're still monitoring your KT over V. You can still, you know, have that stuff dropped off. And as you mentioned, there are a lot of devices now. Um, I'm not going to plug any dialytic device names, but there are devices that are becoming a lot more simplified to, Mm -hmm. um, to Mm -hmm. utilize at home that require, um, less water, right? Uh, um, yeah, you're talking about the, uh, the Tableau. Yep. Yeah. 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 Now you can talk about Tableau all day. I'm, I'm, okay. I really like, I like the device. I think it's excellent. I really do. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to seem like I was endorsing anything, but, uh, but the Tableau device, I think is going to be, um, revolutionary for, Mm -hmm. you know, outside of hopefully these other you know, implantable devices, artificial kidneys will come around soon. But, sure. but yeah, and and also, they're also looking at reimbursing for in-home care. So, for mm-hmm. instance, right, there's always that notion of, well, someone can't do in-home dialysis because they don't have the assistance or they don't have the, you know, mainly the assistance to do it. Well, right. they're considering reimbursing um nursing staff to to be able to go in home and assist them with that. Yeah, it's uh, it's awesome. And uh, the advancements that we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing the uh, Xeno uh, transplantation of a pig, you know, pig heart, pig kidney, all these type of things, the bio uh, kidney. I mean, the advancements that we're seeing are incredible. And now, you know, talking about home dialysis, that Tableau machine, uh, I believe her patient's name is uh, I spoke with one time. I haven't had her on the show but I've spoken with her and she told me that she, uh, her name's Tracy, Tracy Amati, I believe she Mm -hmm. was telling me that she gets like 12 boxes 
of uh, supplies versus when I was on next aids, my first delivery was 74 boxes. Oh my goodness. And so when they brought 74 boxes and dropped them on my doorstep and I was a dialysis patient, I was still pretty weak Mm -hmm. and I had to pick up those boxes and move them myself. And some of those dialysate boxes are quite heavy. Heavy, yeah. And so, you know, you, you got a real good workout as a dialysis kidney patient by carrying those boxes in boxes, so to, yeah to be able even to with the pd patients they oh, yeah. get all these yeah, boxes yeah. dropped off absolutely pd patients and so the uh, advancement with dialysis is incredible the tableau i mean if you could reduce you know the the boxes the supply down to like 12 boxes i mean that's mm -hmm. a, that's an incredible reduction and uh, reduces the load on the kidney patient. So that's in, that's incredible. We had a quick question here from KWM uh, Toronto, Canada. He said, uh, do you find that uh, telehealth lowers patient stress levels? Um, I will say it probably is stressful for people who haven't experienced it in the beginning, right? So, so like I've had some patients who are new to telehealth and they, they're really nervous about it because they were like, I've never done this before. But it's as simple as I text you, you get the link text to your phone or email to your phone and you just click it. There's no downloading. It. And that's the other thing. When I first had this idea and started this in 2018, pre-pandemic, it was hard to find vendors that made things seamlessly and easy on the patient side. That's like my rule number one is it has to be easy for my patient. And so it, it when they once they see that it's just a matter of clicking this button and it opens up and they're able to see, oh, I've already gotten my labs done. I can sit at home. I don't have to worry about traffic. Um, I don't have to travel, whether it's an hour or so away. And most importantly, what I like the most, and I do think it lowers the stress in this aspect, is some patients, when they get referred from their primary care doctor, they may say, oh, I need you to see a kidney specialist, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some who the whole time they're waiting on this three-month appointment, they're thinking, I have to start dialysis, right? Or they're thinking something's really, really off. But with telehealth, it alleviates you having to wait so long just to sure. be told, no, you don't need dialysis, but you know, this is where you are in your stage and we're going to, we're going to work on things. So right. I think it helps to alleviate the stress of waiting. Um, and just knowing that, and, and for me, I like to say, just knowing that I am, I am there at just the press of a button. Absolutely. No. Yeah. And that gives a great ease of mind for a lot of patients because like I said, when you can't get a hold of someone directly or you're waiting on that phone call back, you know, they could be lengthy. I mean, some some patients mm -hmm. I've heard they they have a heck of a time getting a hold of their transplant coordinator or they have a, they have a long wait period to, to, to hear back from nurses and stuff like that. And and I understand that, you know, there's a flow and overflow right. of care and patients and things. There's like a that. lot they're doing. There's a lot going yeah. on. But sometimes it, it, you need that, you know, peace of mind to know, hey, I know when I'm going to contact Sharika, she's going to get back with me uh, as soon as possible. Listen, <laughs> and I love to text. If you all you have to do is know how to text or if not, you know, you leave a voicemail and, and we get back to you. And it's not just the patient, but it's also their primary care provider. It's their mm -hmm. other specialist. That's another benefit to telehealth is. You know, it's kind of like we use our we we live by our phones now. Oh, yeah. So it's a oh, lot yeah. easier to just text your loved one or FaceTime your loved one or email someone than it is. OK, we have to wait on this letter to get there or I need yeah. to get to their house when they're yeah. home. And once, you know, if I have a practice that adapts to this model and this practice over here or like um, virtual nutrition, nutritionists, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there are renal dietitians who, who provide consultations virtually. That means the two of us, we communicate seamlessly because this is what we do. 
Yeah. We know how to easily, easily send a patient to a renal dietitian, easily update me on what's going on versus, you know, if you're still stuck in an older model. And that was the thing when I left this group, um, I had another group recruit me and and my immediate thought was, well, you guys operate the same way they operate. Right. And if that's the reason, you know, I'm leaving here, I'm not going to fall into another system that does it the same way. So I said, instead, if you allow me to start up telehealth in your office, mm-hmm. in your practice, I will come. Yeah. And they were not interested. So wow. for that reason, I said, well, I have to be the change that I want to see. So that means if I think telehealth and remember, I was seeing rural patients over an hour away. I was driving to them. Yeah. yeah. So telehealth really helped not only for my local patients, but my rural patients. And then I also get to work with rural hospitals that don't have kidney doctors. OK, so, it, so that's. It, it, yeah, it gives you more options and more and broaden your horizons a little bit. Well, for them, they don't have to now send their patients all the way to the next town. Right. They can still care for them in their town at their hospital and provide for them what they need to and not have to deal with that because it's stressful not only on the patient because they still have to get back home, but also the family. We had another great question about access and uh, things like that. So patients that need like a vascular access, um, do you have like, do you consult with like a, a vascular surgeon? Do you have one that you use specifically? Like when you determine that a patient, you know, is going to need dialysis, maybe they need a fistula installed and all that type of stuff. How do, how do you go about doing that using like telehealth? So it's the same way as in person, right? You just you just forge relationships. So, mm-hmm. for instance, in my town, we have a relationship with vascular surgeons as well as the surgeons that do our PD catheters. And so mm-hmm. in a timely manner, you send the patient there. The only downside I will say is when it's time for someone to be on dialysis, whichever center they attend, they will then be under the care of the probably the medical director will assume the care of of that of you there at that center whereas yeah. normally for me um i would just follow my patient or my patient yeah. would go to whatever center that i'm at or follow my patient to their center yeah it sounds pretty standard uh because you know i i came in as an emergency case so i did everything backwards according to my fat vascular surgeon but uh, as far as kidney failure and kidney disease, because I crashed into dialysis. So right. I didn't really have a chance to talk with my nephrologist about modality choices and things right. like that. I was forced to have the central line, the permacath put in and all that stuff. I did the fistula later, uh, but um, I pretty much was referred by my nephrologist to the vascular surgeon. They said, we want you to get a fistula and, uh, you know, and all that. And so I, I did so by way of referral over to him. And mm-hmm. he did that. As a matter of fact, I had a great uh, vascular surgeon. They had trouble with my, uh, my fistula uh, early in. They couldn't figure out where to stick me uh, at first because the, the, the uh, fistula hadn't exactly it wasn't mature. M- mature enough. Yeah. yeah. And they started using it and they had a, about three successful treatments. And then I went and got the central line taken out because they said, you can go get it taken out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I come back and then sure enough, they can't find where to stick me on the, uh, on the, wow. what was it? The, uh, the, the second one, the, um, Lord. You have uh, your the, arterial uh, the, and your the, venous, the venous side. The venous, the venous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The arterial, they were fine with, with the venous and they, and what it was, my, my fistula curves a little bit. Oh, and okay. so they had to bring him back over and he brought his little iPad, you know, vein mapping. Uh-huh. Uh, he had one that looked like an iPad. And basically he he did like the ultrasound right on my arm and he took a magic marker. <laughs> and, and marked he, for this is where they're going to stick. Yeah. He said, this is where you sticking. And he said, you know, there shouldn't be any problem. And he said, give me the needle. I'll do it. And he right. stuck, and he stuck me. And I told him, I said, I'm going to get this tattooed for you guys because there should be no guessing at this yeah. point, you know. But, um, you know, luckily I had a technician in there. Uh, God bless her. She was 20 year tech. Uh, 
That's what I was going to say. Yeah, she, your tech is going to be your saving grace. Yeah. And yeah. she was my go-to. Like when I yep. walked in the door, I said, I would, I would like to have her, I want her. Get her, please get her, you know? And they were all like, yeah, let's get her to do it. Cause he's got that fish dealer that curves like a hook, you know? And so, but um, yeah, when uh, it comes to access, um, your tech is definitely going to be your saving grace because, you know, even, even through my training, what we learned that, they didn't do as much of is analyzing fistulas on a monthly basis with um, like ultrasound. Yeah. So it was one of those things of once it was ready to stick, you know, you probably you go get some angio done, you know, ever so often. But um, actually doing ultrasounds to evaluate patency of fistulas, um, they just started doing away with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that oh, is I true. Also... That is true, Steve. He, he's saying, yeah, if she uh -huh. calls out, you need someone else. And that is true, Steve. And I had to uh, I had to I had to be patient with some of the other techs in there. And luckily, uh, you know, they finally figured it out because my fistula had uh, actually matured enough to where they they could finally figure it out. But early on, Steve, it was it was a mm -hmm. little hairy at times. I got uh, infiltrated many times and bruised up and beat up pretty bad. Uh, from some of the other techs in there. And that's the reason why I was like, give me her. Cause she never did do that to me. As a matter of fact, she would, she would kind of scoff and like say, I don't know why you guys are having so much trouble. Like I can just stick him, but yeah. you know, but again, it goes with, you know, they were trying to use the fish a little too early. Uh, it wasn't mature enough. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I think it happens a lot to a lot of dialysis patients uh, early on. Uh, I hear it. I've seen it a lot, you know, where people talk about, you know, uh, they bruised me up or infiltrated me. My fistula is brand new and they can't figure out where to stick me sometimes and things like that. I, I've seen it many times. You you know, one thing I also wanted to mention along the lines of um, telehealth, but with transplant, mm -hmm. um, there used to be delays in transplant evaluations. And then, you know, years ago, um, at the facility where I trained, they did studies on, well, how effective is it doing pre-transplant evaluations? Because we would get a lot of people from Kentucky. Um, oh, I'm from know. Kentucky. <laughs> yeah. And so we would have people come from Kentucky to Tennessee or even come up from Alabama. Mm -hmm. And what they noticed is by doing those pre-transplant evaluations remotely, you can kind of speed that process along instead of having them to wait months and months until that transplant evaluation. So, right. you know, telehealth is something that, and, and maybe I'm just biased, but it's definitely the future of not just kidney care, but care. Also, back when I first, you know, started getting interested in the field, I will say like what you all have now with, with the support systems and the podcast and the groups that you have, mm -hmm. I don't remember seeing all of this, yeah. you know, then. Yeah. You know, in the 90s and the early 2000s. And now that it's we're utilizing the Internet, we're utilizing social media more. It allows everyone to connect and hear one another's story. I have I have places to send my patients to now. Right. Go yeah. listen to Hope with Jonathan. You know, go listen to this podcast. Go check out yeah. this group to get more encouraged and to kind of yeah. understand from other people's stories. Yeah. So absolutely. So just just care in general you know, kidney care, the kidney community, all of that is just changing when it comes to the use of just virtual interaction. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And there and there's a whole slew of us. And, and when I was a patient, I was getting a lot of knowledge from uh, Dad Vice TV on, mm -hmm. on YouTube and uh, Urban Urban Health Outreach Media with uh, Steve Belcher and uh, uh, the Warriors Quest Show with Jared Brown. I mean, there's a whole slew of uh, wealth of, you know, knowledge and information that a lot of us are, are doing a lot of things. And uh, there, there's a lot of others that I'm failing to mention at the moment, but they have great podcasts, great, great, great yeah. ways of learning and uh, great ways of spreading uh, information. Uh, there's Transplant Talk with uh, Nia Shonda. Uh, Lattimore, and uh, there's also uh, Philip Paris Jones with the Sacred right. Chance. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of, but they're there we're utilizing uh, technology for the greater good to spread awareness and uh, education, and just to try to get uh, the word out that look, yeah. you know, kidney disease is prevalent. Uh, we definitely need more donors. 
Uh, we need awareness for uh, people that are, you know, facing the great odds with uh, battling diabetes and hypertension being the top two leading causes mm -hmm. of chronic kidney disease, uh, definitely affecting uh, different uh, minorities, uh, you know, and things like that. So all this education needs to be talked about. Yeah. We need to get it out there to the masses. And uh, I believe prevention is huge. Prevention is key. And uh, we can utilize these tools such as, you know, the Internet telehealth, all yeah. these things to our advantage. And, uh, you know, my, right now, the future is now for me because this has been the way that my transplant has been treating me uh, ever since I've had my transplant. I'm doing all my appointments through telehealth. So do you do gene testing? G testing. What is gene. that? Uh, gene? gene testing. No. What, it, what? So, so even, um, cause you actually, I watched one of your podcasts and there mm -hmm. was a lady sharing her story on mm -hmm. how she had membranous. Okay. And I say that to say to how we're testing for diseases through your blood. We're testing for failures, right? For transplant rejection, we're able to use your blood to mm -hmm. test it and not have to wait on scheduling a biopsy, you know, or waiting on the pathology report. So these are, these are all advancements that help us as nephrologists to say, okay, well, I'm going to go check your blood for transplant rejection yeah. and, you know, and get this done ASAP. Now we're still in that era where we're still doing biopsies just to kind of, uh -huh. you know, make sure definitively we know that, you know, what type of the transplant rejection it is, but there's gene testing now in which they're looking at markers to determine and, and yeah. not just look at the markers to determine if you're, what type of failure you're in for your transplant, but to follow those numbers. To yeah. see how you're recovering. Yeah. And I just want to rest assure everyone out there that my transplant team has specifically told me, Jonathan, if you feel bad, something changes. Uh, you check your blood pressure and it's just sky high or mm -hmm. you just don't feel right or you wake up swollen or there's just something not right. Contact us immediately. Do not hesitate. Do not procrastinate. Please give us a call right away. We're here for you. So it's not like they're like, OK, we're just going to treat him telehealth and, you know, we pushed him out of the way. That's not what's going on. They are staying on top of me really, really strongly, but they're utilizing telehealth because I'm an hour away from my transplant hospital. So it makes sense for me that I really shouldn't have to travel all the way down to my transplant hospital mm -hmm. just for them to see me and talk to me about my blood work or talk to me about just general stuff. Oh, you need to go get the vaccine or right. all this stuff. They sent me text messages. They send me emails. I talk to them on the phone, uh, all these things. But then we're utilizing telehealth to do our visits and things right. like that because there's really no need for me unless something majorly or I'm just deathly ill or uh, and even with the COVID, they were like, no, you don't need to come in. We want you to stay home and we'll tell you how to treat yourself. And because guess what? You would have gone, you would have gone to an emergency room probably hours away or however far away it is mm -hmm. to not only, you know, sit in a waiting room amongst other sick individuals just for right. them to tell you, yep. oh, go home. You're fine. Yeah. Oh, well, my local hospital here would have sent me to San Antonio because they would have been like, oh, he's a transplant recipient. Mm -hmm. So let's send him to San Antonio to his transplant hospital. And that's literally what they would have done with me. And mm -hmm. then I would have got down there and they would have said, hey, we, you know, you should have just called us. Right. This is what's, you know. And so that's what for me is what I think makes sense about utilizing, you know, telehealth telemedicine. It's it's quicker. It's saving people money. I'm sure it saves yeah. you money as far as like overhead costs and, and staff costs and things like that. I'm sure it's some in some form it's probably saving you money across the board. It does. And you know, one thing I like when I like to encourage my colleagues, right? Mm -hmm. I, I like to encourage my colleagues that insurance companies, you know, of course they don't want to spend a lot of money. Uh, one of the things that they encourage us to do is to talk to one to one another <laughs> remotely, our colleagues. Yeah. Like when something happens, the last thing they want is for someone to be taking care of Jonathan and just watch and watch and watch and wait. And then he has to go see a specialist. If you have a question about his creatinine on day one, just email or call his primary care doc or call a specialist and they can tell you what to do. 
Yeah. And if they say, okay, we'll just reach it. And we used to do that in the VA. That was the other thing in the VA. We used telehealth a lot when it came to the pandemic, but because we were hybrid, we didn't do a great job at it, but we, there were a lot of instances in which it was just a simple question. Hey, this is someone's potassium. This is someone's creatinine yeah. or, uh, or, if, or they didn't have a VA in another city. Okay. Yeah. We need to get this person um, referred for transplant. I would do their initial transplant evaluation remotely. Don't send them all the way here. Just for me to say, thumbs up, I'm going to send you to the transplant center. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, it's just a waste of time really. And so, you know, you kind of become a third wheel or third party at that point, you know. Right. Um, but uh, what about international? Are you able to utilize uh, kidney health, uh, telehealth, you know, with international patient? Or are you just able to utilize it just here in the United States? Me personally, I do not. But you can. So you can do like mission. You can do mission work in which um, you could probably partner with programs or projects, because guess what? It, there is the reverse. There are some um, like teleradiology companies mm -hmm. that are international and they're reading our films here. So you can you can do it. You just have to make sure you have your, you know, the right um, guidelines set in place. But uh, but me personally, I do not. I do anticipate to branch out into another state. But as of right now, I do um, just Georgia. OK, just Georgia. Yeah. So let's talk a little, a little bit about in closing, because I mean, we shared so much great information and this has been a really informative show. Uh, I feel like we could have talked <laughs> probably another hour. Easily. I know. Uh, I know. Good uh, questions. <laughs> uh, what about uh, remote renal care? So that is your yeah, that's your name of your practice and what you're doing. Um, and you've got this website here, uh, www.remoterenal.com. Uh, is that how yes. people can and patients uh, are are contacting you and, and get a holding of you? Yep. So on that website, we do have um, a link where you can schedule an appointment um, or you can call to schedule an appointment. We take self referrals. So, for instance, um, you know, I may have I have someone who saw a kidney doctor in Florida because they had kidney disease, but now they're in Georgia. So instead of waiting on their primary care to refer to me, you know, I can just start that care because they consciously want to make sure they don't fall through the cracks. But we also do take referrals from other specialists um, like cardiologists. You may need a procedure, but they want kidney clearance first. Right. Mm -hmm. Or um, same with surgeries. And then we also do inpatient care, mostly to the smaller hospitals that don't have um, kidney doctors available to kind of help manage their patients in their town and not lose those resources by having to ship them out. But the most important thing I love about my website is that we have information there. Mm -hmm. So we, I like to present information in the form of an FAQ because one of the things that I truly value is when patients have questions. I love questions. And when patients don't have questions, you know, the way I like to work is I'm going to tell you the questions you should have. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I'm going to answer them. So each mom, whatever topic I'm educating on, I like mm -hmm. to feature I'm um, an FAQ to just kind of talk about these are the questions you should ask your doctor or anyone. And these are probably some of the answers you should expect. Um, so we definitely have that information on there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you have like an app or anything that you utilize as well or, or how does that work for you? Yeah. So we our patients have a, access to a patient portal. Mm -hmm. And so at the top of the website is where they can access it. So once they are enrolled as a patient, um, they have access to the portal. They can send a message there. They can send an email there. They can um, access their labs. Um, and I go over labs line by line. I don't just tell you your labs are fine. We go yeah. by line by line. This line is what it is. Line. This is what it should be. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Um, I know my, my, my facility, they kind of, you know, focus on the, the creatinine, potassium, sodium, uh, things like that, you know, the bun and all those type of things, but, uh, they don't that's go, over, they don't go over 
every line with me, <laughs> but they go over quite a few and, and yeah. hit on the, the most important ones to them. Um, so, but um, this has been well, such an impactful show. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah. In the beginning I do, I'm very detailed. I even, mm -hmm. um, I even go into detail on nutrition because whenever I see something is off, like I already know if my patient is vegan, I'm not going to give them suggestions that are not vegan. Right. Or if I know my patient is, is doing this. So, so in the beginning, yeah, we are um, very detailed and just because honestly, that's just how I would want to be treated. So. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to hear that a, a doctor say that, you know, uh, that, you know, they, they treat the patients how they would want to be treated. So I mean, uh, I don't understand how there's any other way. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. It's, it, it's someone's life. Like, how is it any other way? I mean, it's, it's so true. Like uh, there's someone's life weighing in the balance of your decisions. Right. And yeah. the way that you're going to treat them. And, and so it is important. And uh, talking with them is important. And eye contact is important and mm -hmm. <laughs> and the way mm -hmm. that your demeanor is and the way you your attitude and the way you treat the patient it's all important it definitely it is. is it definitely is but uh i mean if you're in a bad mood uh and your patient's going to pick up on that and vice versa if the patient's in a bad mood then the right. doctor's going to pick up on that so it's you know kind of, kind of a 50 50 uh play there but it's it, it it's great to hear that a doctor cares so much you know and um, it's it's been a great show. Lots of information shared. I feel like we could talk for another hour. Or so thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. It's, and this is also another reason why I said I have to work for myself because I love getting out and educating people. When I worked with my first group, I was like, "Hey, let's let's get on the local news for Kidney Month and let's do this." And they were like, "No, we're not interested." We don't, oh, wow. we don't want to get you on the news and get you talking about stuff. Just go see. So I love that. I work for myself. I can create my schedule to where I can, you know, do conferences or, or speak out more because I will say there's a lot I see on social media and I'm like, but it doesn't work like that. Yeah. That's it great to hear. It's like great that. to hear that you want to have a voice and you want to get yeah. out there and create awareness. And I don't understand the concept with the restraining of, uh, of wanting to create awareness. I mean, uh, get out there. Because you should be seeing patients at that time. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you utilize your voice for the greater good and your celebrity and, and use your, your status for the greater good to create awareness. That's the way yeah. I look at it, but that's, that's just me. Uh, you know, and if I was, if I was a, a wealthy doctor or wealthy physician that, or surgeon, I, I would be doing the same thing. I'd be creating awareness and talking about becoming an or organ donor and let's create awareness. That's it. Disease. I'm registered. All, all, all that stuff. So Right. But, uh, well, Sh Sharika, you've it's been a, a real pleasure to have on the show. Thanks, and, Jonathan. Uh, it's been it's been incredible. We've had a lot of people uh, interacting with us. Appreciate all the support. For Thank the you. And uh, you guys have been incredible asking a lot of questions on the show and interaction. Really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sharika Briggins, would you like to uh, leave a shout out to anyone? Well, I would like to shout out Erica because of Erica, I met you, Tafaro, and Philip. And I think, you know, meeting more kidney warriors and speaking out more and learning about, like, even all the people you've mentioned. Like I have definitely been studying and following them because it, this is, I think this is so important to the future of kidney care than it is what we're studying on the scientific side. Because if people are more aware of how to recognize, how to prevent, how to identify, then we may not need as many of what we're trying to come up with. Yeah. So I am just very appreciative of, of being welcomed into um, into this realm of the community because, you know, although I'm not a warrior myself or I don't take care of someone, um, this is my passion. And again, um, this life of mine is not just for me. Um, I have a strong faith in God and I know my purpose here is to serve others. And this is, the, I wouldn't do anything else. Yeah, so need, thank you for having me. 
We we need a million more like you, maybe ten more million like like you. We're we're out there. <laughs> we do, we really do. And if, for for those of you that missed the early part of the show, go back and listen to why uh, Sharika uh, got involved with uh, nephrology and and her story. It's just incredible. And um, so again, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing Thanks, your Jonathan. story. And uh, hopefully, you know, I can have you come back on some other time of and uh, talk with you. I think you're are you you're interacting with the uh, conference that we're doing with uh, the Second Chance. I am. Okay, yes. so I'll, I'll see you then. I'll be on that <laughs> conference as well. <laughs> so that's going to be impactful. So yeah, you guys get ready for that. That's going to be a, a great conference Exciting. on uh, dialysis with uh, a second chance with uh, Philip uh, Harris Jones Jr. and it's a far uh, cook. And it's going to be a great, there's going to be a lot of great people in there. Uh, to, oh my uh, goodness. Yeah. Uh, They've announced like Hill. a lot of the warriors. Like it's um, just a powerhouse of people. Yeah. Bella Langston, Fred Hill, uh, uh, Tay Beasy, uh, Jonathan Trailer. <laughs> yeah, you cannot forget him. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Brookins, he's going to be on there. So it's going to be incredible, guys. So don't miss that. Do not miss that. Actually, Anthony Reed as well is going to be on there. So it's going to be it's going to be a really impactful show. So you guys don't miss that. But again, guys, I really appreciate your support tonight. We ran a little bit over, but that's OK, because this, this type of information is definitely worth it. We, we need this kind of information out there. And so uh, really appreciate all, everyone for tuning in to Hope with Jonathan. I hope you guys have a blessed evening. Stay safe out there and remember to take care of your kidneys. God bless you. Thank you.